I was a child of the 60s. I was in college in the late 60s, early 70s, went through the term. It was a, in Canada, a slightly different political culture, but nonetheless very far left. And that's where I got my education in radicalism. I never was a, a Marxist. It, as I wrote in the book, if I was, it was very short, probably for a weekend, and it must have been a good one because I can't remember it. Charles Krauthammer's career, and to some extent his life, have alternated between science and politics. He wanted to be a physicist, still does, I hear, but decided at age 16 he didn't have the chops for it. Then, like Socrates, he embarked on a second sailing. He studied politics and economics at McGill and spent a postgraduate year reading political philosophy at Oxford. Then, unlike Socrates, came a third sailing, an MD specializing in psychiatry at Harvard and a residency at Massachusetts General Hospital. Then back to politics, where over the course of the 1980s and early 1990s, he sailed gradually from left to right, from the New Republic to the Weekly Standard and to his wonderful gigs at Fox News and the Washington Post. His story is told and told exceedingly well in his best-selling book, Things That Matter, Three Decades of Passions, Pastimes, and Politics. Charles, welcome to the American Mind. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. You get to do all that sailing if you turn down the hemlock. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm not sure that Socrates would have... Well, he was always interested in science even when he made his turn, so you and he are not unlike in that respect. Did you know that when the Nation magazine reviewed your book, they did so under the title, Floats Like a Vulture? Uh, I'm afraid I missed the uh, review, but I'll be sure to check <laughs> it out. It sounds like a flattering one. Yes, well, it, it implies you do sting like a bee. Uh, w when I won the Pulitzer in the mid-'80s, the Nation ran a review by, uh, well, an uh, article by Alexander Coburn. And he said, not only should I have to give the prize back, <laughs> not only should the committee have to resign in disgrace, but I should be tried for war crimes. So I'm used to negative reviews in the nation. <laughs> it's, well, uh, there aren't that many readers of the nation anymore, after all. So I understand why you might have missed at least one of those reviews. Um, one of your intellectual heroes, when you were studying political philosophy way back when, but since then, too, you recommend him in your book, uh, is John Stuart Mill. Uh, why? What, what attracted you to him? Well, it's it sort of, I was driven to him. I was a child of the 60s. I was in college in the late 60s, early 70s, went through the term. It was a, in Canada, a slightly different political culture, but nonetheless very far left. And that's where I got my education in radicalism. I never was a, a Marxist. It, as I wrote in the book, if I was, it was very short, probably for a weekend, and it must have been a good one because I can't remember it. But I was repelled by radicalism on the left, and in Montreal, where I grew up, there was a very, there was a right-wing anti-immigrant nationalism, like the Le Pen movement in France today. So I lost my appetite for romanticism, where I became, rather than left or right, I was kind of a social democrat, left of center. But I developed a taste for and an affinity to moderation, at least in uh, philosophy, if mm -hmm. not in policy. And that's when I discovered J John Stuart Mill at Oxford. I had read, you know, we did this chronologically. I started with Hobbes, and I was repelled by Rousseau, for example. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of Marx and Hegel. But uh, John Stuart Mill seemed to me to personify this kind of philosophically non-eschatological mm -hmm. uh, political philosophy. You don't redeem the human soul. Uh, it's a kind of minimalism, if you like, leave me alone. Now that's a little bit oversimplified, but the idea that there's a sphere of rights that are inviolable and that the truth is not to be imposed but to be discovered by contention. Those are sort of the, the, the central ideas. Those attracted me. It captured that sense of moderation which is not out 
either in academia or in the streets at the time, and that had a lifelong um, impact on my thinking. And he was, of course, a, a utilitarian or a kind of utilitarian. Right. Are you? Well, he wasn't. No, actually, he was a reformed utilitarian. He rebelled against it. He was an anti-Benthamite, which was sort of highly oversimplified. And that was his uh, genius, that he turned it into a far more expansive and deep philosophy. So I never was a utilitarian. It's an, a, being a utilitarian is like reading a primer when you're learning language. It's like Dr. Zeus, philosophically, but you graduate to books that contain words with six or seven letters. So that, I mean, I never lingered on utilitarianism. But this idea of limited government, limited aims, and then I mentioned it when I recommend to college students what to read, mm. Isaiah Berlin, a contemporary 20th century political philosopher who was at Oxford, uh, wrote a wonderful book, four essays on liberty, two of which are about John Stuart Mill. And one is called John Stuart Mill and the Ends of Life. And he made a very simple but important distinction between political philosophies that, that tell you what the, what the end of life is, the purpose of life, the teleology of life, and uh, Bale, for example, is sort of the father of the school that says, no, that's not what politics ought to tell you. It's really uh, a manual about means, it's not about ends. And the genius of it is that you decide your own ends, but in an orderly universe uh, underpinned by liberty. But that sounds a lot uh, like libertarianism. Uh, and of yes. course, Mill has this one very simple principle he asserts in on liberty, which is very attractive to the libertarian mind. But you're not a libertarian either. No, I'm not, and I doubt he would have been a follower of Rand Paul, or certainly not. <laughs> or Ayn Rand. Ron, or Ayn Rand, or <laughs> a lot of Rands, or, yeah. Ra or Ron Paul. Um, no, he didn't have a tin helmet with uh, aluminum antennae. Uh, libertarianism is sort of the literalism of John Stuart Mill mm -hmm. in Berlin. It's sort of like somebody who's a literalist, fundamentalist, in religion, it's interesting, grounded, but it's not, it doesn't capture the spirit, and it produces in real life a distortion of the philosophy. Uh, libertarianism, I've always thought, is an excellent and uh, irreplaceable critique of conservatism, but it is not a governing philosophy. It's too poor and limited to be mm -hmm. a governing philosophy. It needs to account for uh, the modern welfare state uh, the, the, the fact that we are not living in tiny republics. I think the Constitution is a sophisticated adaptation of Mill. Mm -hmm. It recognizes size, it recognizes there's a role for the state, and it tries to circumscribe it within a regime of liberty. But if you, if you go for pure individualism, you end up in a completely impractical fundamentalism. Mill was, of course, uh, uh, um, not a natural rights natural law thinker. He rejects all such appeals. Um, and is this, does this go for uh, Charles Krauthammer as well? Absolutely. I've never even understood natural law and natural rights. <laughs> I remember being in a lot of seminars at Oxford on this. And I know what it is. I know how it's defined. But uh, I never could define the ground on which it stood. Natural as defined by is decreed by whom? It seemed totally arbitrary, and I don't particularly like philosophies that begin with arbitrary decrees. Uh, what, I do, what you like about Mill is these propositions that they're individual rights. There's an inherent sphere for individuals, which I think, uh, whether you call it a natural right or not, I don't know, but the word natural has little appeal. Uh, I would prefer the word inalienable uh, or, uh, you know, as in the Declaration of Independence, self-evident. Mm -hmm. Um, but natural has a lot of connotations of canon law and all that, which I find slightly hard to understand and hard to adhere to. But if, um, um, if Mill believes that, a, a, that Socrates dissatisfied is better than a pig satisfied, as he famously says in the, in, on liberty, he, that's a kind of natural right. I mean, that assumes one can tell the difference between human beings and other kinds of beings who are not as important or as high, as dignified, 
as rational as we are. I'm glad you brought that up. Because the thesis, which I never completed at Oxford, uh -huh. I'm one of the thousands, uh, was on the conflict between the aesthetics uh, and, the, and the ethics of John Stuart Mill. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you come to the proposition that people have this sort of unlimited sphere of liberty, yet the Mill makes all kinds of judgments of what's you know, higher forms of life and lower, well, how do you square that? You know, I mean, you're making these judgments. You're not leaving it entirely up to the individual. He tries to square it, and I think fairly successfully, by, by sort of an expression of faith. In a sense, the truth will out. Mm -hmm. So the higher expressions will likely succeed if you give them an right. open forum. And that's the way he does it. But there is, as you say, an inherent tension between the idea that you can make aesthetic judgments, which are what's patientist mm -hmm. and what's uh, elevated, uh, and yet uh, make no judgments about pe how people ought to behave, at least in this sphere of individual liberty. He doesn't legislate that you no. read poetry. Of course, no. But, but he, he is, does he, that you not hurt somebody yes. who's reading poetry. No, no, that's right. Well, maybe your mistake was going to Oxford instead of to Chicago or someplace where uh, you, I mean, one of the things that distinguishes you... Well, I made a right at Labrador. <laughs> so, I don't know, maybe Unlike that Unlike many, I mean, uh, you, you're some kind of neoconservative, or at least you once were. Um, and many of them were affected by Leo Strauss, by the teachings of, uh, from Chicago, his students, and so forth. How did, you, how did you escape that particular contamination? Willfully. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a GPS. I went the wrong way. <laughs> No, I mean, it, it, you have to sort of put yourself back. Oxford, early 1970s, it was the growth of modern language, of mm -hmm. plain language, right. ordinary right. language philosophy. Uh, Rawls was writing, I think, just around that time uh, at Harvard. Uh, so it was not, uh, I, I was living in a different universe. I had what you would call an empire or Commonwealth upbringing in Montreal and mm -hmm. McGill mm -hmm. and Oxford and that sort of you might say American Straussianism was not even part of the conversation right what was part of the uh, debate at Oxford was continental philosophy so it wasn't sure. Strauss who was the person he had to argue against it was Hegel and Marx and Rousseau and the whole continental philosophy and that was that's what energized us at the time so I discovered all this later, but by then I was so old I couldn't absorb it. <laughs> um, what about analytical philosophy? You must have had some of that at Oxford. It drove me crazy. It's one right. of the reasons I left Oxford. Right. It was too small. Very much so. It was just, you know. Logic chopping. Uh, chopping to the point where you wanted to flee and scream. And, and no screaming was allowed in the seminar, so I just had to leave. <laughs> Now, at this point, you were, as you say about yourself as a young man, um, a great society liberal. Yeah. And were there, did you have problems with being a, a, a million and a great society liberal at the same time? I'm not sure it ever occurred to me. <laughs> I sort of had a box where I thought abstractly. And then I sort of had my natural inclinations, but I hadn't really examined growing up in a sort of a liberal milieu. Not mm -hmm. highly liberal, it wasn't a political family. But... Um, where to be a social democrat was to be a right-wing mm -hmm. fascist in the in the 60s. In the context, yeah. Yeah, and that was part of the debates. Uh, and at the time, I mean, you remember that uh, in the 50s, Lionel Trilling basically decreed that there was no conservatives, there was no right. opposition to liberalism. So if you go back in time... None intellectually respectable, at least. Right, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. That, that you would hear in the halls of academia. Uh, I didn't live in New York, I didn't go to Chicago, I didn't have that exposure. So my horizon was sort of continental philosophy, English philosophy, and as for the politics of it, remember also I grew up in Canada. So it wasn't as if I grew up with the Great Society. I grew up with right. Pierre Elliott Trudeau and with the Social Credit Fascist Party in Quebec. It was a whole, you gotta remember that Quebec is a continental island in North mm -hmm. America. So its political culture is very European. There are general strikes in Quebec. There are none in the rest of North America. There are fascists and communist parties. Uh, and there are political debates which are on the European style and not the American or English Canadian. So I sort of was by sort of instinct or almost inheritance mm -hmm. 
a great society, liberal, and it's only when I came to sort of examine and look at the results that I began to, to tack the ship in the other direction, to use your metaphor. Thank you.